um, Adam Nagorny began his long and excellent journalism career as a political reporter for the Gannett newspapers, then the Daily News, and then USA Today. But most of you probably know him as a trusted chronicler of national politics for the New York Times, which he joined in 1996. And then in 2010, this lifelong New Yorker jumped ship. He became an LA bureau chief for the New York Times and moved west. Uh, this year, he returned to national politics. Amazingly, with all of that, he managed to write two deeply reported and fascinating books. Out for Good, which was published in 1999 about the gay rights movement, and now The Times, how the newspaper of record survives scandal, scorn, and the transformation of journalism. Here it is. The new book is riveting, but don't take my word for it. All of the reviews have just been amazing, and it is really a, a page turner. Uh, Rebecca is going to post in the chat where you can order it. Um, and for me personally, this is a special pleasure because Adam and I were neighbors. We lived in the same building during his New York years. So it's it's really great to welcome him as a journalist whose work I admire so much and as a friend. So Adam, welcome to At Lunch. <laughs> Thank you for that great introduction. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be back with my favorite uh, neighbor and one of a, a great journalist and book writer. 12 books, is that right? It is. It's ridiculous. I wow. know. I am really it's impressed. A, it's like a disease. Yeah, but I wasn't, you know, covering <laughs> presidential elections in between. But so that brings me to my very first question, which is about your books. So both of these books, um, and I'm very pleased to say I've had the chance and the pleasure of reading both of them. One, uh, they're both very big subjects, one about a hugely important movement, the gay rights movement, the other about a hugely important institution. And yet, I think you could argue that even though these are big cosmic subjects, they're both deeply personal to you. So I'd love to hear the origin story of both books. And then why such a big gap, 24 years between <laughs> book one and book two? <laughs> um, uh, that second question is definitely a question from someone who's written 12 books. <laughs> um, the first one was kind of, um, it's just circumstantial. Um, somebody I got to know, his name was Dudley Clendenin. You might have known him. He used to be an editorial writer and national correspondent for the New York Times. He decided that he thought it would be a good idea to write a book on the history of the modern gay political movement. And he went to a mutual friend of ours. I think it's worth saying his name because some people might know him. His name was Jeff Schmaltz, and he was an editor of the New York Times. Um, but when Dudley went to meet him and asked him whether he wanted to write the book with him, Jeff was sick with AIDS. And this was at a time when it was a inevitably failed disease. That obviously changed a couple of years later. But And Jeff said, listen, I can't do this. I'm, I don't think I'll be around long enough. But I have a friend who might be good. So Dudley and I went out to dinner in Washington and he proposed the idea. And I was like, that sounds like a big, substantial book. And um, so I take no credit for the idea. I just said yes. And that's how it happened. Um, uh. As to let me let me do the why, why so long. I don't you know, it was hard to do a book. Um, as you know, a little traumatizing. I was a little bit of a baby about it, but I <laughs> knew I wanted to do another book. And. I'm not sure where this idea came from or when it came from. I think it came from reading Gay Talisa's book um, on the history of the Times when I was in college, which is one of the things that made me want to work at the New York Times. It was, for anyone who hasn't read it, this wonderfully written uh, book about the Times post-1969. And at a certain point, I began thinking that I'd like to do a sequel to that book. I don't want to overstate that because I'm, I'm nowhere near as great a writer as Gay Talisa's, but the idea of it and... I thought about it more and more. I talked to people um, and I finally decided about eight years ago that I'm really going to do this. And I sort of set out and I went to meet the publisher of the paper at the time. His name was Arthur Schultzberger Jr. and said, if I did this book, would you cooperate with it, with um, interviews? And he waited a couple of weeks and he came back and he said, I will cooperate. Yes, I'll give you as much time as you want, but I'm not going to tell anyone else what to do. Keep in mind, this is not an authorized biography. It's an independent piece of work. What I did not anticipate, and I should have anticipated, was that once the publisher said yes, 
pretty much everyone else who's written about in this book said, yes. Like in retrospect, of course that was going to happen, but that's what happened. So that's that's how these two projects came to be. I think um, the second project I feel more as a labor of love, like I feel is a really important book about, or topic, excuse me, a topic, a book about an institution that I believe is vital to American media, to American politics, and to American society. So I thought that was a big subject that I always wanted to do. And don't ask me what <laughs> long it will take me to do my next book. <laughs> Hopefully not twenty. Well, years. I think you've done an unbelievable job. And I will say uh, one of the things that I really admire about it, having been on both the reading side and the writing side of this kind of a book where you're intimately involved with people that you're writing about right. and you are not gentle on people. I mean, this does this. Nobody would accuse you of doing a puff piece. And I'm, I, I guess the question that a lot of people who I've talked to about the book, you know, I have a lot of friends who are journalists and of course everybody's right. just eaten it up. And what was, you were working at the time, you know, you do right. work for the Times. I do. But I guess partly what's been the reaction from your colleagues, um, positive, negative, or just silence? And is there a difference between the ones who are in the book and the ones who aren't <laughs> in the book? That's a great question. A couple of things here. One is, as you no notice, the narrative ends in 2016, and there are a number of reasons I did that, one of which is I think you need the time and the access to candid interviews and the archives to write it correctly. But the other thing is I did not want to be in a situation where I was writing a book about people that I worked with or worked for. So with two exceptions, there's no one still at the paper that is talked about in the book. The two exceptions are A.G. Salzberger, the current publisher, even though I, in the book I talk about him during his formative years, and Carolyn Ryan, who's the, man, who's the managing editor now. So I guess that makes it easier um, or less uncomfortable. The, the reaction has mostly been um, excellent. I've gotten an incredible number of notes from colleagues um, saying how much they enjoyed and learned from the book. And I don't think, I'm always very suspicious because of what I do. I don't think people were blowing smoke. I mean, I think it touched a lot of people um, um, and they really enjoyed learning things about the paper and seeing patterns and learning about things about why the paper is today, what it is. I've gotten a few comments of like, why didn't you write about this? But that's inevitable. I got that in the last book too. Um, the, the bottom line is I'm very comfortable and happy with the way the book came out. What you said there about not pulling punches is very gratifying because it was important to me that the book be read by smart readers as honest and dispassionate and not pulling punches. And I think that these are all, you know, the book is built around this, the uh, six executive editors. These are all, in my opinion, brilliant, but really flawed people. And I would argue that ultimately dedicated to the same mission, um, but also really flawed people. And I hope that that complexity and nuance came across. Yeah, I mean, it, it does. Um, look, it's super juicy. I mean, it's not huh. succession. They're not evil people by any right. stretch of the imagination. But one of the things that really struck me reading the book, which I should have known, I mean, I, I worked at the Times for a very short period, but, you know, it does get hold of you that place. I mean, I went, I went there for what I thought would be a year in between books, and I stayed five years um, because... It's, it's a big rush to work for a place like that, but the egos that you're writing about are just kind of monumental. And one of the things that I was struck by was the elitism, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Ivy Leagueism. And then I did notice you didn't go to an Ivy League school. You yeah, went to yeah. a good SUNY school. And I yeah. was wondering, <laughs> A, were you conscious of that while you were writing the book? And do you think it's changed uh, in the last number of years since your timeline? Yeah, those are great questions. As to the first one, I was conscious of it. And at various points in the book, in particular, talking about the paper's trouble in getting a, a diverse newsroom, hiring people of color in particular, women to a lesser extent, that I talk about this as a group of, you know, overwhelmingly Ivy League educated, elite people, um, and that infused everything they did. I think that the New York Times status for so long as the preeminent, we can do nothing wrong paper reflected the attitude of a lot of people up top. Um, I would argue that was not healthy, but it is what it is. But also for your other question, that has changed. I think there are, I, I can't tell you this statistically because I haven't seen numbers. I sense there are many less 
Ivy League people there. It's a much less elite institution. I think that reflects the way our society has changed, but also the New York Times, which I still think is a very respected, for the most part, great newspaper, doesn't have the status in our society that it once had, because honestly, nothing does. So that's a change. <laughs> right. So well, I think this sort of attitude, sorry, I was going to quickly, this okay. attitude of like, we know best, right? Which I'm, I can't remember whether it was like that when you were there. It might have been. Like that doesn't cut it anymore. So I think the paper is more modest. Yeah, no, I mean, I, would, I left in 2000, so 18 years ago, I left quite okay. a long time ago. And that was really, it was just starting to make the shift to having more of a web presence and so on. Interesting. Um, and so, yeah, quite different. And and one of the things I, I looked at actually with nostalgia in your book were some of the discussions. I mean, I remember this going back even to the Wall Street Journal, you know, the, the, the determination that everything should be factual and the kind of pretzels that people would turn turn themselves into to make sure that everything was verified by multiple sources and before the paper would send something out because mm -hmm. they knew that being in the New York Times held such incredible gravitas. And now I know that a huge number of the copy editing staff has been eliminated. And That's I right. know as a, I, I think I'm a pretty good and careful reporter, my butt's been saved many times by a good copy editor. And now a friend who shall go unnamed who still works at the time said that she feels that the readers are now the copy editors. You know, the first version goes yeah. out on the web, somebody writes in to complain, and then there's a, then it's fixed en route. And I was wondering, do you think that, do you yourself experience it and see it, this difference in carefulness just because there's no time? Yeah, well, yeah, I was going to say there's two reasons. One is obviously the elimination of the copy editors. But the stories are still rigorously edited, but you'll see pretty regularly kind of grammatical errors, who, whom, then, then, that a, a copy editor would catch. But I think that was a business decision on the part of the paper. How do we resort, how do we allocate resources, right? We can probably come back in 10 years and think, was it worth it to eliminate this extra bank of editing? so that we can hire some more digital people? My guess is the answer is gonna be yes, but I think more important is watching the paper try to adjust to the faster pace that we live in, right? As you said, if I was writing a front page paper, sorry, that was on a sensitive subject, it would be fly spec by a dozen people because you had time to do it, right? Well, now there is no time. There's a real premium on getting stories up as fast as possible, which means that you know, mistakes are made or nuances, uh, you know, new, mistakes of nuance are made. Classic example is the editor's note that was required after the paper's initial headline on the bombing of the hospital in Gaza. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff that's going on now. And I think that, again, this is next book stuff, not my book. You know, someone else have to write this in 10 years. The paper is trying, in my opinion, to balance off continued dedication to the institution of the paper, the kind of coverage that the New York Times has always done that distinguishes the New York Times. But at the same time, understanding the world that we live in, where you have to be faster and quicker and that we're a subscriber-based organization now. So we have to think about what readers want to read. So that's the sort of struggle that's going on right now. Yeah, no, and and, and I feel I feel for the paper. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's my book as a reader to try to keep up. So as a writer and, and reporter and editor, it's got to be out of control. And I guess the other thing that comes along with that, that's maybe a, a, a companion question is, you know, the whole idea of the faceless voice of the New York Times writing wow. a story and now boy <laughs> everything feels like there's a little that I think there's a lot more opinion or slant in the stories themselves and maybe I, that's just my imagination maybe it's a stylistic thing but what do you think about that no I think I guess I would say there's more vo this is said the co this is obviously a big debate at the paper there's more voice I think I would say there's more point of view and I would differentiate informed point of view. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I write a political story, hopefully it has an informed point of view. There should not be opinion or bias, right? You should not be able to read a story that says, you know, that abortion rights is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, do I think that some copy slips through that does crosses that line? I do, but I think that's something they're trying to police right now. I think they're, 
they want stories to have more voice. They because you know there's that's what people are looking for, and I get that. But more personality. Um, that does not mean, in my opinion, that people should have opinions of their voice and stories, which of course does happen sometimes. But that's you know that's what's going on right now. I've always like you tried to write with voice, with point of view, to sort of talking to readers with hopefully some information. You know, I've been doing this for a long time, so hopefully an informed voice. So I don't think that's necessarily so bad. I think what's dangerous is when people with less experience and don't really get that nuance try to do it. And you, sometimes you do see the line being crossed there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, you know, and it makes the paper more enjoyable. I mean, I think, you yeah. know, for me sometimes, and this goes back to the copy editing question is sometimes it takes a long time into a story to find out what it's about, you know, because not yeah. strictly just all of us, no matter how experienced you are, you're writing really fast. It's good to have another eye on it. But, you know, another question that I've been really thinking about after reading your book, because, you know, look, the Times uh, ability to be successful with the mm -hmm. move into the digital age is remarkable, right? Yeah. Um, and you write about it. But then I also think, you know, it has to have also benefited enormously, weirdly, from the election of Donald Trump, you know, because who among us? whatever side you're on, although I'm hoping <laughs> more people looking, whatever, um, but <laughs> became glued, glued to our new our screens, right? Right. And so the question is, do you think the Times can continue to be as successful when, without Trump or some equally polarizing figure? So I think um, that that's a question that the paper has been struggling with. Um, I think it's answered, but let me just say, in this book, I talk about, the book ends in 2016 with the election of Trump. And, you know, I'm, in, I'm attending one of the executive committee meetings they allowed me to attend. And people are a little bit freaked out about it. And they're freaked out about backlash, threatened um, boycotts by readers who were upset with our coverage of the 2016 election. Um, but what they realized really soon was, in fact, we were getting floods of new subscriptions. The paper was getting a lot more readers and that eventually became known as the Trump bump, that lots of papers, I'm using the word paper in a generic way, if you don't mind. Yeah. You know. um, <laughs> I still get the benefit, <laughs> You know what I mean? So it benefited from all the fact that people were so, whatever, fascinated, horrified by what was going on with Trump. But here's the thing, I, from, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't really write about this period so much, but I definitely have studied it. I, there's some of it here. I think the paper understood that it could be transitory and did things to build on it. And what they did over these past couple of years is they kept investing in the news product, right? Doing lots of stuff, but also expanding. So there are other reasons why people would want to buy a subscription. NYT cooking, which I bet you use. Word, which I don't use. Wordle, sorry, whatever it's called. The games. Uh, uh, wire cutter, right? I mean, the paper circulate the, the circulation just went over 10 million like last week. And that's the reason why. And contrast that with, you know, the struggles, the Washington Post, another, in my opinion, superb newspaper is having, trying to build up a digital circulation, trying to maintain their, um, their bump after Trump, so to speak, even though Trump might be coming back. Um, and the lesson here is I think, yes, Trump was really important for a while. But it wasn't a one time, I think, when you come back to me in 10 years, some of them are wrong. It wasn't a one time thing. People were really interested in news. Um, I think the Times was smart in getting people to form habits because we know how important habits are um, to begin to read the paper, to, again, to read the website, and also extended it to make it more valuable to people. So, in a way, the Times, I think, took advantage of the moment. I'm not sure other papers did. Um, the other question, which is a little bit side question to what you're saying, is we're going to find out if there is a market, an audience of people who are willing to subscribe to more than, say, two people, people papers digitally. Like, I assume that, you know, you know, I subscribe to the Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the LA Times. Well, I'm a freak. You know, like, most people aren't going to do that. I'm not even sure they would subscribe to two people papers. And that's a big question as we go forward. Um trying to figure out how the world of journalism is going to evolve or devolve. Yeah, or devolve. Yeah. yeah, but it's, you know, those are the devolving or evolving is an ongoing question, right? But, right. Um, you know, one thing I think people should hear about, I, I just want to say again that 
while the book deals with these sort of larger lofty questions, it is filled with incredible stories, story after story. And some of them are heartbreaking and amazing. Like the, you know, I, I think it's worth buying this book and reading it just for Adam's account of the Times' coverage of 9-11, which was extraordinary. I was actually at the paper at that time. It was amazing. People who were doing that coverage were also scared out of their minds like other people yeah. who live in New York. And I think that the way you covered that was absolutely riveting. But then there's all the other stuff where, you know, you're dealing with these personnel decisions and firing and hiring. And, um, you know, a friend of mine said, was he reading their personnel files? Because <laughs> it seems like you were. <laughs> yeah. And then some of it's really kind of brutal, like what happened with Jill Abramson. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was just, there's a lot of texture that's really like, and I mean this in the absolute, as absolute high case, it's like watching a riveting TV series, a lot of it, just because the drama is so great and so specific. And so the question is, how did you do that? This was more than just interviewing people. Yeah, that's right. So I I set out trying to interview everybody who were players in the book, which I did. And I, that's the only that's useful to a point because I'm talking to people about events that happened 20 or 30 years ago. And memories aren't great. I mean, I can't even remember what happened 10 years ago. And people also, I think, adjust memories to make themselves more comfortable with them. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that for the most part, people are being dishonest. That's just the way human beings are. Here's what was different here. Um, first of all, I went through all of the newsroom's archives that are stored over at the New York Public Library. Like I spent months and months, more than a year, going through these papers, and they were incredibly valuable. Um, they stopped, the Times required their their editors, top editors and business executives to uh, donate their, not donate, turn over their papers to the archive. <laughs> they stopped doing that in, I think, 1992. But after that, the executive editors who had not been part of that program, I asked them to share with me their personal papers. And journalists being journalists, they had thrown them all in boxes and they would bring them down and just give them to me. I mean, I had to kind of bleed a little, bleed a little bit. And I just went through them and I just found shocking stuff. So that was a big, big part of it. Um, I just kept put, you know, you would think the Times would have a really organized in-house archival system. They don't, it's just another organization. So I was going through papers and looking at old oral histories from people um, who are players in the earlier part of the book who are either dead now or had a level of candor that you would not expect. Um, in one really sort of critical moment, there was a, um, kind of legendary editor at the Times, a man named Al Siegel, who was kind of the keeper of standards. You might have even known him. I did. Um, and I always thought he'd be a really key player in this in this book. And I went, I took him to lunch to talk about interviewing him for the book. And he said, I'm not going to participate in this book. And I wasn't sure why. I thought maybe he was getting old and didn't trust his memory. He's since passed away. Maybe he didn't want to re-engage these fights. But then as I was poking around, I learned that he had taped hours and hours and hours of oral histories contemporary with when he was there with the condition they not be released until he left the paper and Abe Rosenthal, the, the first executive editor of my book, leaves the paper. And they were just unbelievably searing and revealing. And I think stuff like that was really crucial. Uh, the Jason Blair, the serial plagiarist I write about, um, somebody gave me his entire personnel record with the condition, if I wanted to use it, that I get per, that I called Jason, who I had interviewed, and asked if it was all right. Jason was like, "Sure, go for it, use it." So I think having that stack of paper, personnel reports, the emails back and forth between editors about him was incredibly important in telling the story. Uh, Jill Abramson very generously let me go through her papers. I was able to use the um, evaluations that Arthur Sulzberger Jr., the publisher, did of her that did of her year to year. They showed how quickly and dramatically his uh, opinion of her declined. And the second evaluation, which is just um, just painful to read, um, is clearly setting the table for him to fire her later on. Um, but, you know, Julia, I think it's much better to tell the story through contemporary documents like that than just to have Jill Abramson or Arthur Schulzberg or tell me what they were called from the time, you know? So that's, that's what really, I hope drives the narrative more than anything else. Yeah, no, it absolutely comes across totally clearly. Um, and 
I just, I, you know, as I said, I know personally what it takes to do this and you've just done such an incredible job, really great. And it's, it's, it's a, a fun, maybe the wrong word, but it is really a great read. So there are two cre uh, questions by anonymous attendees, oh, yeah. but uh -oh. they're both related to the, to the scary topic that you probably don't want to talk about, but yeah. let's, yeah. but let's talk about it a little bit because in yeah. a, and after this, I want to talk about a little bit about your Jewish identity because this is the American Jewish Historical okay. Society. So, you know, forever, I always have defended the times against people who say, oh, it's too pro-Israel or people say it's too pro-Palestinian or it's too pro-this or too pro-that. And, you know, in fact, I think being hated by everybody is often a really good thing uh, for, a, a, I mean, being criticized for that because yeah. it means you're trying to achieve some kind of balance um and so i guess the question is is this something that's gone on forever um and i will ask i'll tell you these two questions also and you can answer or not answer them somebody says that the anti-zionist jewish voice for peace group is less than one percent of american jewry yet their representatives are frequently quoted in the times isn't that evidence of bias um and so what do you feel about this whole bias question um okay so the paper has always confronted this or getting certainly in the trump coverage um the coverage of the iraq war in 2003 accusations of bias um getting it wrong two things i think the pat answer of journalists is that we're getting hated by both we're getting criticized by both sides we're doing something right that's sometimes true um but it's sometimes not true i think in this case what's going on is that you have a newspaper trying to cover this incredibly polarizing issue where people are just totally disagreeing about what's going on and trying to figure out what's going on, as we said before, on deadline and sometimes getting it right. And as the paper's editors acknowledge in that editor's note, sometimes getting it wrong. I, my experience watching the paper on stories like this, and I'm thinking again of covering um, Iraq after the 9-11 attack, was that the paper might go too far one way wrong, come back the other way to try to fix itself, maybe overcorrect, but ultimately gets it right in the long run. I think the most important thing to remember here is that these are basically people, editors, journalists, who are just trying to cover a story as well as they can. And obviously you have personal opinions and feelings, but I think that this is not an example. If, if someone gets a story, like I'll see, people criticizing the Times for anything on the, the Mideast coverage and say the paper is either pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. I, I don't think that's the right way to um, interpret it. I don't think that's what's going on. If people screw up, it's because people screw up. People just screw up in this business. And, and I think, as the Times editor's note said, that's what happened with the bomb, that Aaron headline for the first two hours of the bombing. But I would argue that it is not correct to say that it shows any kind of bias on the part of the men and women who were on the desk trying to cover the story. That this too simplistic. Um, the bias is towards, you know, maybe speed. The bias in this world that we live in. The bias is, these are all mistakes we've made again and again over the years. The bias is just to assume that a certain narrative is right before challenging it. And I think the paper has made some mistakes again, as the editor's note said, and corrected them. And I just, I, I think it's wrong to try to interpret these as, as bias. Right. So um, I, I, in the book, one of the things that I was, it was, I think maybe in that acknowledgement, you talked about your family's long and deep connection to the New York Times. And I think for, I didn't grow up in New York, so I didn't grow up with that. Um, but Anybody I know who did grow up in New York, I think, shares that. And I was wondering, did you have that feeling as a kid that the Times held some kind of sacrosanct place for you as something? Was it a goal of yours to work there? And so I guess, could you tell us about what it meant to you growing up and then as an employee and then now as something you've written about? Are those the same feelings or are they different? Yeah. So it was a huge factor in my house. Everyone read the paper. My father worked, I think you might have known this, my father, Corb Nagurney, worked, was the head of the New York Times Publishing, I think it was called Times Book and then Quadrangle for a while. Everyone read the Times. I mean, I don't think 
Um, I shouldn't admit this, but I don't think I ever read the Daily News or the New York Post until I got older. Um, I, it was just something you read every day. It was a big part of life. It sort of was validating and it was a the sort of definition of like success. And when I got the school, SUNY Purchase, not Ivy League, um, I knew from my first year what I wanted to do with my life, that I wanted to cover national politics for the New York Times. And um, I mean, this is like a provable fact. And like most things, I went to like a college reunion and people were like, wow, I can't believe you got to do what you always want to do. So, you know, through the ups and downs of the paper, I think in the book, I get across the idea that this is not a far from a perfect place, a very flawed institution, but this is where I always wanted to work. And I, I've just loved working here. And even on dates when I just want to shoot myself, I think the paper is screwing stuff up or I'm screwing stuff up as a reporter for the paper, I still think it's a great place to be. And, and um, it just very much is a validation of the whole way I worked. I grew up. I grew up in Westchester County. Um, in, uh, and I, obviously the New York Times was a big part of life there. Yeah. So then related question, um, this is the American Jewish Historical yeah. Society. <laughs> and we do like to, peep, I, I always like to ask people, um, what your Jewish identity has meant to you, both in terms of your work and your life, if if anything. Um, so in in terms of work, I'm I, I'm wary of defining myself in terms of my identity in any way. Uh, I try to think of myself as a reporter. I think that's not as uh, as uh, as as accepted as it used to be. In terms of my life, Jewish identity is central. It's become for whatever reason, more and more as I've gotten older, you know, we go to services, Shabbat services, probably twice a month, at least in Los Angeles. And um, it's just, there. it's a big part of my life. Uh, I don't know why it's a big, it's a much bigger part of my life than it was 20 years ago, but it is. Interesting. Well, I think what I'm talking about in terms of your work, not so much of it in terms of your identity, the way we talk about identity now, but do you think there's mm -hmm. anything about your Jewish upbringing that affected the way you approach your work? I think Can it does, to, I'm sorry, to the extent that like, I try to write about values and the way people try to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And, you know, when, when you're covering politics, it's easy just to write it about as a game and he's up, she's down, blah, blah, blah. And I've always tried to writing about Bill Clinton or Barack Obama or even George W. Bush. You know, this is what's motivating these people. This is what it's in their soul. This is why they want to be president. And that's why I've always tried to think about that. And I, I think that does reflect sort of my own sort of Jewish identity and the way I think I think about people. So interesting. So, uh, you know, I, I was thinking to you know, going back to talking about the book and the way you've structured it. I mean, this is strictly or you, yes, you talk about the digital revolution, right. but you're very focused on news. This is a very much about the news pages, not not the arts pages, which was yeah. my yeah. center of the universe or the um uh you know the it, it's not really about the 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 non-news sections of the paper which i think for a lot of people maybe less now i'm not sure or maybe more now because of times cooking or whatever have been hugely important so i was wondering was that something that you decided along the way or was that that something that from the outset was your goal in terms of writing about the newspaper um, I never really thought it through, but the more I thought about it as I put the narrative together, the more I realized that the through line of this was the newsroom. And those were the really big, important stories. Um, one exception to this was in the 19, late 1970s, when the paper created the special sections, including the art section, I forget what it was called at the time, the dining section, as a way to dealing dealing with the you know, deteriorating advertising revenue and deteriorating circulation. So I write about it there. But generally, this is a, you're right, this is a, a book about the newsroom. Um, I think, for example, that if you were to look in the index and look up sports department, I'm embarrassed to say you won't find anything there. I didn't mean any disrespect. It just didn't really play into the story I was trying to tell. Yeah. So, that's interesting. So one of the questions that has come up in the chat that's not Israel related, and I appreciate there seems to be one person who's anonymous, you can identify yourself, it's okay, who's very interested on that subject. And we tried to talk about it a little bit. Yeah. But somebody else asked a question 
that um, is interesting. So it says the Times in recent years used some freelancers as regular contributors, as in ensuring that they get one large and one smaller review. I assume this is on the arts page per week for a set price. This seems to me to be a way to evade labor laws. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or know about that? I don't think I know enough about that to answer. I think maybe what they're referring to is that for a while, we the paper reviewed books, both in the daily section and in the book reviews. We'd have two reviewers doing that. Um, I do know that there is a lot of stuff that the paper has reviewed. And they're trying to rethink that. And that, you know, I think it does require bringing in stringers to do some of them, a lot of them. I don't think it's a way to cut labor costs. It's just a way of trying to cover a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm curious, you know, overall, if you look at the paper and we're really, really, this is not evaluating it for maybe from an institutional point of mm -hmm. view, but from your experience as a reporter overall, and maybe it's impossible to answer because the way news is delivered now is so different. But do you think that it's, do you think it does a is it better now at reflecting what's actually going on in the world than it was before or worse? I am going to say that I think it's better. Um, I think a couple of reasons. One is, as your friend said, the paper is edited fly spec by its readers. I think it makes us more honest, not that we weren't honest before, but also we think of things, the paper thinks of things, excuse me, that it wouldn't have thought about before. I think the fact that it's a digital organization now, for better or for worse, there's more stuff, right? <laughs> like, you know, again, I stress better and worse. Like when you have a print product, right? You only can have a set number of stories every day. Well, that's not the case anymore. And I think that allows us to write about lots of different subjects that perhaps we wouldn't have written about before. Um, and I just think there's more people working there and there's more churn and there's more debate. So I think that overall, the paper does do a better job of covering the world um, and the country. Because of that, does it miss stories or screw up stories? Absolutely, we see it all the time. But I think on a, you know, I, I just think on a curve or on a slope that the paper again, overall keeps getting better. One of the big changes going on now is that obviously they, they're playing with telling stories in a whole different way. Um, the recent example I keep coming back to was this visual presentation on the fires in Maui. I don't know whether you saw it, but they sort of told it using people's uh, cell, phone, cell phone cam photos of what was going on. And it was just such a riveting way to describe what was going on. Similarly, the story that the paper did about the tunnels under Gama, Gaza that Hamas bought, built, same thing, just really detailed and just understanding that we can move beyond the constraints of print. And I think once we move beyond the constraints of print, um, the paper's telling stories with more depth and more and telling them better. So the answer yeah. is, yeah, I do think so. The long way. So it's interesting you brought, bring up the thing about the Hamas tunnels, which I also found quite riveting. There is one attendee or anonymous ten yeah. attendee, but I think this person does represent a, a group of people yeah. who feel that no matter how much the Times reports on Israel and Hamas, that it will probably never be fully satis satisfactory to some segment of the readers. And I guess the question is, um, how are those decisions made in terms of one question they ask that that some people have reported about Hamas's use of sexual violence on October 7th and Israeli media is reported and the Times haven't. I would assume that the Times wants to verify it independently or are you being assaulted by a lot of questions like this or not assaulted, but being no, asked by these questions at all? Um, um, I, I should stress to, to you and our viewers here that I'm I'm not involved in any way in this coverage, so I can't directly answer these questions because it's not there. But I do know from everything else we cover that we're you know, the paper is very careful um, about not putting publishing stuff that it can't verify. And you know, I'm not talking about this particular story at all. I just don't know. But I know they're going to be very, very careful um, about not putting something up that it can't make sure is true. And there's a lot of stuff that's out there that is questionable or maybe is not true or is just not verifiable yet. And, 
you know, again, going back to the hospital thing, I think the, the lesson of that is, um, this is me talking, not the paper. Like, I think slower is better. I think sometimes less is more. I think like, this might be old school thought, but like, if we don't know something for sure, don't, we can wait, don't say it. So maybe in that case, again, I don't know the sexual violence. Maybe that's what's going on. I get emails all the time from friends saying, why is the New York Times reported this? So I'm, I'm used to this. And <laughs> on the other hand, I appreciate that because I, you know, I might forward them to somebody, you know, my brother works on the, on the international desk. I might forward them to him just to make sure they know about them. But believe me, they always do. I think that, you know, we have a huge, the paper has a huge team on, on, the, on the ground there and working out of London and New York and every place else covering this stuff as well as they can. I don't, I don't think they're, I, I mean, new, as part of the DNA of a reporter is to get stuff in the paper, right? It's not to withhold news. So I think if something's true, they want to do it. And I think the most important thing that people read the Times or other people's P papers should understand is that, again, the driving in forces, the, the driving impulse is to get news out to the public. Thank you. Well, we're almost at the end. I can't believe this. This is such a good conversation, but I do, before we have to sign off and before people sign off, I do want, again, as you can tell from this conversation, Adam is an not just an incredible reporter, but an incredible thinker. And um, I highly urge you to buy his book and to read it because I think once you, once you start, you won't stop and you'll really enjoy it. And then the final question for the day, which you probably won't be able to answer, but it's a personal question yeah. for me as well as somebody yeah. had asked me, do you have any predictions or have you heard anything about the end date for the times in paper form? You talk a little bit about oh. the, the transition from paper to, to, I mean, I use both. I actually have the same too. and I, I do too. read it, but you do read both. Cause oh. for me, watching the way the news is presented in the actual paper is quite a different experience. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do both, but I start the morning looking at the paper edition because I want to know um, I want to know what editors of the paper are much smarter than me think are the eight most or six most important stories of the day. Yeah. I need that to figure stuff out. Um, that said, I, I have no inside information, but I do have, I obviously have studied this enough to have some ideas. At some point, the print edition is either going to go away or just go to Sunday. I don't know whether it's 10 years or 15 years. Right now, the paper is still making money, a significant amount of money from paid subscribers. I think it's like $800 a year. That is a lot of money per person. So it'll be a while, but I, I do think it's inevitable, maybe not in our lifetimes, but maybe in our lifetimes that the print paper is going to go away. I do think that's going to happen. I don't think, now here I'm just guessing, I have not seen or been told that there's some grand plan, um, you know, a phase out you know, plan, but I think that if you were to, Talk to A.G. Salzberger, the current publisher. Um, uh, he would tell you that, yeah, at some point we're going to get rid of it. We just don't know when. That's my guess of what the correct answer to that question is. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. This has been really fun and informative. That. And um, I hope our viewers have learned something. And you'll learn even more if you buy Adam's book. Thank you so, very much. It's terrific, thank Julie. I really, thanks to all you guys. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye.